Naoto Shiragane, the detective prince, the analytical skeptic, and the emotionally restricted one, the party member that we have the most dedicated time with before they actually join your party for good, first being introduced in Kanji's arc at the second dungeon, and making occasional but more frequent appearances until her own dungeon arc five dungeons into the main game. She's the last party member to join, and her dungeon is the last bit of the story before it starts radically ramping up into its final act. So who is the Naoto Shiragane that we understand ourselves to know before her dungeon? And how does that change with our understanding of her character thereafter? Naoto enters the story as a transfer of the prefectural government to help with the ongoing investigation of murders in Inaba, following the lack of headway over several months in finding a fitting suspect. As noted by Adachi and Dojima in previous arcs, it's clear that Naoto is not welcomed on the force, with Dojima's drunk self clearly projecting insecurity, proclaiming that he feels humiliation that they thought a kid could do his job better than he could in his own town. Still, Adachi describes in the same sense that Naoto is what the government is calling special support, and according to Adachi, is a well-known hotshot from a private agency that has assisted in solving cases for multiple generations before now. Kind of like L, if I were to make a comparison. Adachi was surprised at how young they were still, though, given the reputation, but as we learn later, Naoto actually even carries a new Nambu Model 60 gun, which is the standard issue police weapon. So if being sent by the prefectural government and being an extremely revered asset in a multi-generational line of detectives wasn't enough to sell the reputation, they put their money where their mouth is and made an exception to the law by letting her carry a gun even at her young age. Apparently, Naoto is a first year at Yasogami High after this transfer, however, the oldest of Risei Kanji and herself. This starts awkward as Naoto is immediately popular with all the girls at school as they assume that, well, this spawns an interesting dynamic as she shows no interest in all these girls or engaging with them, the feeling being that Naoto sees the time spent as frivolous, part of the serious detective persona that they put on. Prior to their dungeon, Naoto is believed to be a boy by the party, due to her short hair, restrictive masculine dress and style, and male uniform, as well as her intentionally lowered gruff voice. This ends up being a catalyst for initial confusion toward Kanji's sexuality in his own arc, as well as perhaps Kanji's first time truly questioning his own sexuality, as he immediately has feelings for Naoto. Unfortunately for him, but as repeatedly shown in the story, Naoto does not return Kanji's feelings, something that can be seen in the consistent ignoring and brushing off of Kanji's blatant advances, as well as the fact that Naoto never blushes or gets flustered with Kanji, with an exception to a single cutscene at the end of the game during the ski trip, but is very quick to with the player character, and honestly, even with many times where things that Yosuke says could be interpreted as flirting. Despite everyone pretty much having the hots for you, the player character, this makes Naoto one of the most transparent in her feelings, regardless to if you do her link or pursue romance at all, with more scenes and moments like this involving Naoto than any other girl, aside from uh, maybe Risei, but due to Risei's way of intentionally guarding her feelings and putting up an act, it becomes a bit less transparent. Naoto is initially dismissive and critical of the investigation team once she meets them, seeing them as a bunch of bored kids occupying themselves with a case that they should stay out of and are quite frankly way in over their heads for, while she sees herself as a real detective. And I mean, she is a real detective, but this and one scene with Risei speaking quite harshly about this leads one to infer early on that Naoto may feel insecure about her maturity, or how that is interpreted by the people around her. Naoto is also not very good at understanding when things are a joke or not, often responding seriously to joking statements or being flustered by things in a way that they weren't meant to be interpreted. After Naoto starts attending Yasogami, the investigation team takes on a focused effort to include Naoto many times, like during the trip to Tatsumi Port Island. This is where a prominent moment of Naoto's misunderstanding happens, with the weirdness of Risei and Yukiko's actions leading Yosuke to try and comfort Naoto, trying not to make her any more uncomfortable than she's feeling, but when she voices her uncomfortability, she asks them if everyone has been teasing and making fun of her. 
They were just generally being silly and acting dumb, but Naoto took that silly answer to her serious question as a dismissal of her identity, herself as a serious person. Like, they didn't just dismiss her serious question, but dismissed her as the person to be taken seriously asking it. This compounded with the earlier scene involving Rise builds an image of someone who is subtly much more emotionally fragile than they present, with an insecurity they are trying to cloud by this emotionless logical appearance. An insecurity compounded by Naoto's initial threat of being dismissed by the police force after Kubo is assumed to be the killer, and Naoto expresses serious doubts and concern. Eventually, Naoto comes to her own conclusion that these people are, in fact, the people who are saving the new victims of the murderer, and that she believes in their ability to succeed, even if she doesn't have faith, they feel comfortable telling her the truth of the situation or how they do it. So, without directly telling them, she does an interview in order to intentionally be kidnapped as the next killer's victim, and that's where we finally get a more direct look into who Naoto really is through the dungeon and boss. The Midnight Channel appearance of Naoto in the Japanese dub, as well as the English, reflect the intonation of similar mad scientist stereotypes, with the English following a rough German stereotyped accent, and a similar vampire-like intonation following the Japanese delivery. Following with the late-night TV theming, as seen with the three party members prior, this is meant to parody a live medical report, or vital scientific breakthrough, if you're unsure of what I'm talking about. The frequent pandemic updates could suffice as recent examples. As for Naoto's human shadow design, we will go into that later. Naoto claims on her Midnight Channel broadcast that the show is going to do the experiment of the century, the Human Genome Project. Now, the Human Genome Project was actually a really big deal and a real-life project that achieved its goal of recreating the full human genetic code in 2003, roughly four years before the writing of Persona 4. This project, started in 1988, was meant to be a leap forward for medical science and the understanding of the human body. The official government website for the project even stating that finishing a new human genome and the research that, quoting the website now, having the essentially complete sequence of the human genome is similar to having all the pages of a manual needed to make the human body. It's a formula for total human customization, in other words. Naoto, then, is planning on subjecting themselves to this genetic restructuring in the words of their appearance on the TV. This will become more important when we cover the official encounter in the dungeon later on, so keep it in your pocket for now. So in order to enter Naoto's dungeon, you have to confirm something that you already possibly were able to deduce, albeit this is much more blatantly given to you. The things that you learn before taking on the dungeon is that Naoto is insecure about their position as a child, and are often dismissed for their age when it comes to their involvement with the case. The cops see Naoto as an obsessed kid, and Naoto feels treated like a child, despite their valid contributions. The dungeon, as referred to in English as the secret hideout or secret laboratory, is referred to in Japanese as the Himitsu Kesha Kaizo Labo, which expands a bit to specify with Kesha referring to association, and Kaizo referring to remodeling like how you would remodel a room in a house or restructure an organization. So, in full, I believe the English title would be, with a more direct and accurate translation, The Secret Society Remodeling Laboratory. I hesitated to state augmentation, or transmutation even, instead of remodeling here, but both transmutation and augmentation have their own distinct terms and kanji in Japanese. Therefore, the way that the game phrases this does not directly refer to any part of the person, from personality to physicality. It is merely the overhaul to create something greater, the remodeling of a human soul. The addition of association also takes the secret part of the dungeon's title more directly as a reference to noir and detective films and novels, things that Naoto fits aesthetics and personal interest for as we learn in her social link. This idea that a secret society is operating in the shadows, waiting to be uncovered and put to rest, the fact that the base is an underground place with barbed wire and traffic cones dissuading entrance in the middle of the night in the woods also contributes to this classic detective novel aesthetic. Something that the characters take focus of before entering is how cool the idea of a secret hideout is for a dungeon, something that becomes relevant to Naoto's social link later on, as it turns out this is actually based on a real secret hideout that she had as a kid. 
The messages for this dungeon offer far less insight into Naoto than previous dungeon masters, with Yukiko Kanji and Risei's voice all over exposing their different fears, insecurities, and ideas. Naoto's messages are all about defense system intercom, like an order being given out to different people and henchmen. Naoto, also unlike all three party dungeons I just mentioned, does not show up until the end of her dungeon at all. This, in its own right, does also say something about her character, though. She is hiding away at the lowest, most protected, still defense system laden, protected inner sanctum she can find, warning people not to go further as they close in on her. This becomes a metaphor for her fear of letting others in, for other people to see her as unlike herself. Naoto feels, in order to be respected, in order to be needed, she has to uphold a certain level of professionalism, not show cracks, not give away any weakness. That this is how she will succeed and be accepted. The idea of people, even those she trusts, actively pursuing and trying to find her true self locked away behind layers of walls in her self-defense is horrifying to her. So the defense system gives away this fear and isolation. She also repeatedly gives out signals saying things are code yellow and code red, claiming to deploy more guards, and the defense is getting greater, but the threat is not actually seen in a change in the dungeon, as the dungeon stays mostly the same floor to floor. This is an instance where the plain random nature of the level design actually services the themes and narrative at play for once in the story, giving credence to Naoto's empty statements, just like she postures around pretending to be emotionless and preventing herself from being truly known. The dungeon itself keeps up the air of a secret society and laboratory with multi-level decontamination doors, huge ventilation areas and computers projecting visions of the entire globe. Chemical stains also litter the metal floor and hazard symbols of yellow and black mark many of the walls, objects, and rails. The assumed symbol of the secret society is a military-styled bird with the three-pointed tail of a phoenix. This is likely a reference to the society's aims at creating the rebirth and genetic alteration of a person into their perceived ideal self, this rebirth being directly referred to by Naoto in the TV broadcast. The battles and some of the computer monitors also feature a green matrix-like text that scrolls, which contains variants. One is illegible, but the other actually has a fragment of a French Huffington Post article about the resignation of the Japanese Minister of Agriculture. The fact it's in French is probably a nod to common connection between detective fiction and the French language. The actual text translated into English is this. The minister Takehiko Endo admitted on Saturday that the organization he directed has illegally obtained 1.15 million yen, or $9,900, without informing Abe before his nomination. Endo, 68 years old, who begrudged his position, marked with previous defections, has confirmed his resignation at a press conference after an interview with Abe in his official residence. The Prime Minister of the Agriculture of Abe has committed suicide because of another case. So, it involved the secret embezzlement of funds by a branch of the Japanese government. Looking into this case, it seems that the minister hung himself hours before he was to be questioned about the scandal by the Japanese government taking the secret as to where the money had gone to his death. As dark as that is, I think there's a couple implications here, in that the secret base has been funded and operating under those embezzled funds as a sort of real-life conspiracy theory, something also prevalent in detective and mystery novels. I think also this idea of failing or letting people down while also being in this high position and the pressure over it can also connect to Naoto. The only change Naoto does to prevent you from continuing on is locking off important areas at Area 4, which requires you to obtain an ID card at Level 6, and then using it on Level 4 to kill the mini-boss before proceeding back down to the final levels of the dungeon. The mini-boss you fight there is the Dominating Machine, a large red robot with no weaknesses. You can see that this is the way that Naoto wishes they were. Tall, strong, able to deal with their problems, and not having huge weaknesses. Finally, we arrive to the final room, a large operation table with large beating down circular medical lights hanging above, a giant, slightly blood-stained drill and buzzsaw also sitting on the table. Naoto's response reflects her not-yet acceptance, as she, slightly sad, attempts to mask the situation by casually stating, It's about time that you arrived. Dealing with this child has been quite a pain. Naoto refers to her other self as some child that is a pain or a bother to deal with. 
completely divorced from herself. The moment that she turns around, the first thing that we hear from the Shadow is a plea not to be left alone. A desperation about how they feel abandoned and unwanted. While we get the elaboration of this in the social link, what we can currently draw is that this indeed is the insecurity we saw before. The need to be of use, to be wanted, to have a reason to stay. To not feel babysat, or like a child being humored in whimsy and games. Something that, since Naoto isn't a child, is a deep dehumanization. It's a lack of seriousness given to their own experience and their earnest attempt to be professional and helpful to the places that she finds interest in. This is emphasized by the Shadow's sudden shift in personality and direct call-out toward Naoto. That no one takes her seriously as a person. They only want her to help when they need it, and when they don't need her, they put her away, back in the playpen, until she's to be called upon. Shadow Naoto states that it's the gray matter in their skull that they care about, the ability, not the person, and that Naoto has no means to deal with society's two-faced, judgmental nature. The embrace and the dismissal, that no matter how hard Naoto studies, no matter how hard Naoto cogitates and finds the breakthrough case conclusions, that the societal impression of Naoto as a child won't change. At least, until they are no longer a child anymore. And Naoto isn't willing to confront and challenge the society that does that to her. In fact, she sleeps in their lie and bends to society's prejudice just in order to play a part of it. To be left not feeling alone and useless. Next is Shadow Naoto stating that Naoto dresses and acts like the strong and cool men from detective fiction because they admire those traits. The fact that they're seen as cool, strong, reliable. The fact that people always need them, that they look up to them, that anywhere they are, they are always able to offer their help, and their help is always wanted and respected. In Naoto's loneliness, she thinks that she can find a place in society by acting like those fictional characters do. That she can be accepted by tailoring her personality and appearance to fit who she thinks others want her to be. But those characters are nothing but entertainment in a story, and her emulation of them only suppresses her own feelings out of the fear of going unloved. Pretending to be a fake person found in fiction will not recreate the admiration seen in those fake person's worlds. The real world is much more dual-faced than the cool detective story. Then Shadow Naoto mocks the name Naoto, something traditionally given to men, stating that Naoto is in fact not male, and that they expected her to be a boy when she was born, and that emulating men was doomed not to work because they were never male to begin with. Other than Shadow Naoto's line reading as somewhat transphobic, I think it's important to remember the conflation of gender and sex in Discourse of 2008. What Shadow Naoto is saying isn't referring to gender. It's that being born female, misogynistic people, transphobic people, people like the ones on the police force who seek to try to invalidate Naoto anywhere they can, will never accept her identity due to the sex that she was born as, and that if she tries to hide that from them, it's only a matter of time before they find out anyway. She can't go through her whole life hiding her sex for others. Naoto responds to this similarly to her only other line earlier, that she won't throw a tantrum or let her emotions get a hold of her hearing these things, that it accomplishes nothing to do that, that she can find her own meaning, but denying herself the tantrum actually reinforces this suppression of her emotional side and a rejection of herself. It's the idea of putting her personal feelings second to everyone, even letting people who wish to castigate her form her identity for her. Shadow Naoto asks, but more so states, that they made her cry. And why would you try to emulate the same men who would never accept her as who she is? It's harping onto the idea that if she hates the rejection that she feels from the male-dominated workplace, why would she try to blend in with those same men? There's an idea that if they can't accept you for you, why should you change everything about yourself for them? And that if she doesn't stand up to them, she participates in a system that will ostracize and continue to look down upon other women like her in the future. As for the Japanese workplace stereotypes and sexism, We'll get back to that in a moment, though. 
This big reveal, being that Naoto is female, when viewed with a modern lens has been subject to much scrutiny in the West in recent years, mainly with people interpreting this as a poor handling of a trans character, or at worst, anti-trans altogether. I think it makes sense how people would connect trans struggles onto Naoto's struggle as well, with these ideas of suppressing, hiding who you are to be accepted and loved by others, to avoid being ostracized. It is a fundamental part of the journey to many people's LGBT experience, being denied aspects of who they really are, and having to build the pride to come out of the closet and proclaim that they will face the world despite how it may try to push them down. In terms of its messaging, Naoto's message is a positive one for any person. It's general enough to create allusions to all sorts of repressed acceptance, from racial to political to religious to sexual and beyond, but it hits strikingly close to home for people who have faced this sort of discrimination. On the flip side, while the message is good for everyone, Naoto's situation is so particular that people are very unlikely to directly relate to her on a literal event-wise level with the idea of one's identity being something that is apparent from the get-go, and has to be actively altered to be hidden. In a way, it's the exact inverse of a trans experience, with the repressed self being one's sex, who they feel is unworthy of love, and the presented identity being a gender they feel will be more accepted by others, rather than people forcing the born sex onto them while rejecting the identity they take. The most close, literal example of an event like this I can think of for a literal comparison, with many similar aspects, is Ron Stalworth, a black cop who pretended over the phone to be white and eventually became a high-ranking member of the clan without them finding out. He then used his high-ranking hidden identity to get a secret list of all the clan members in the government and power, and subsequently was able to turn them into the government and have them removed. In order to be accepted by the clan, he changed his mannerisms and intonation in a way that mimicked a racist man of the South, but with Stalworth, it was more of an infiltration to invoke a deep change and profound statement, while with Naoto, it's for this othering group to accept her. It has been popular in Western discourse to argue as to Naoto's gender identity in fan communities as well, and so let's try to see it from a modern lens and a historical one. The root of Naoto's appearance, as reiterated many times in her dungeon and her link, comes from an insecurity that the sex that she was born of wasn't good enough to the people in her life around her, that other people won't accept her if she's female, since all of the role models and representations she's gotten have shown those roles to have been male. We understand a person's gender identity to be innate to themselves at this point. Whether they come to terms with it young or old, the central idea is that a person is trans because they are. With Naoto, this isn't the case. She changed for other people to be accepted by them, not because she knew her identity to be a man, but because other people wanted her to be one. This makes the interpretation of her as trans, other than being antithetical to her message and dungeon in the story, also subject to pushing harmful transphobic stereotypes, somewhat ironically. The cut isn't that black and white, though. While we are given the context that she changed for others, her social link after the fact keeps with her mentioning that she sometimes wishes that she never had this as a concern to begin with, and she wishes that she'd just been born male. That being like that would have made things easier for her in this society. Now, this can be seen as either A, a regression on her dungeon solution, similar to how Risei's social link works, or B, a genuine feeling of identity with gender norms outside of her born sex. I think this uncertainty in aspects of her social link certainly opens her up to reasonable discussion, not to if Naoto is trans, as people classically think of such, but a possible non-binary or similar more nuanced identity. The conjecture isn't totally out, since even come her ultimate persona at the end of the game, she still finds herself in the day-to-day -day life to enjoy and feel comfortable in more androgynous clothing. It should also be added as an addendum, though, that androgyny is not equivalent with trans identity, but it does at least open things up to conjecture. I think if Naoto and Persona 4 was theoretically written in the modern day instead of 2008, and existed within that time period and reality, from what we know of her, it's not certain that she would identify as cis, at least. 
But given what we know and what we are given of her personal feelings and statements in the game, she is not presented as trans. One thing I always loved was, even though they tease her for being girly or emotional or childish, they never tease her over what clothes she wears or how she chooses to speak for the entire game of Persona 4. They learn she is female, and they don't expect her to change other than that. They accept her and give her the acceptance that she was afraid that she wouldn't be afforded if they knew the truth about her born sex. I think it's also important to consider the context of when Persona 4 was written, in a rural Japanese town in 2007. What we in the West don't always acknowledge is most mainstream discourse until recently pushed a gender essentialist view, and that was to an extent our knowledge of the medical science. And even to this day, Japanese legal understandings of trans issues fall back on much more archaic than Western standards, requiring full surgery and diagnosis before being acknowledged as such even then not being afforded some legal work and protections you may see in the U.S. Non-normative gender expressions in Japan are still conceptualized sometimes as cis, such as otokonoko, which can refer to a cis-identifying man who expresses themselves with feminine gender norms, and it's long ingrained into the culture as well. While some otokonoko would be considered trans under a Western understanding, they are not words with parallel meanings. In the Edo period, and on to the Meiji Restoration, not fully pubescent men, or men who never grew large musculatures or were largely hairless, took on what many scholars consider now to be a historical third gender in Japanese history, that being wakashu, which involved younger males presenting as women. And while some would be tempted to see this as a parallel to Western ideas of male and female to gender identity, the water is far more complicated and muddy than that. In general, the conceptualization of gender in Japanese language and history has a much different history than in the West. Until two years ago or so, it was the popular view in the West that gender was entirely socially constructed, or that gender was a performance. And that holds true with some who identify as such, but in other ways, this has already become dated as people look at interlocking aspects of gender with aspects of sexuality, gender expression, and divorced urges only constituting pieces of a puzzle that may construct someone's overall view of their gender, and that it's not a performance. It's not something you need to act. It's a part of who you are. In other words, despite there being evidence of more than a gender binary in many cultures for thousands of years, the way the modern world conceptualizes and understands gender is still on the front lines of science and is ever evolving with research and time finally being unrestricted. Just to give an idea for mainstream cultural attention, look at the Google Trend results of transgender-related topics and keywords. You can see the extreme spike in public knowledge and usage in this word in the rise of 2014, which is seven years after the time frame that the game was written. If we compare the terms on a global scale too, Japan does have their own colloquially popular term for trans, instead using a loan word, transgender. Despite Japan having half the population of the United States and including the loan word as a result, Japan's search capacity for LGBT, gay, and transgender comes out to be the least of the top 30 countries at play in Google results. Most of the words that they use to even discuss these concepts in Japanese have also been newly integrated from English words. Also mirroring the US and many other world charts, these terms don't start gaining popularity till mid-2015 with the English spelt word gay still trampling the popularity of even the letters LGBT and Japanese spelling of transgender. This isn't meant as any statement about Japan, or how Japanese culture addresses gay struggles, as historically Japan has been much more sex positive and accepting of homosexuality than nearly any Western or Middle Eastern country. This is just meant to emphasize that the likelihood that back in 2007, the intent of a character was to be transcoded, or more so transphobic, despite the game giving a canon-substantiated alternative explanation, is in my view perhaps the definition of unintended Western chauvinism and jingoism toward impressing Western cultural ideals onto cultural artifacts that do not belong in the West.
while you're still here, if you haven't seen it already, I would also really recommend that you watch my kanji video, which goes much more into explicitly gay imagery of his dungeon, and I do feel that he was undeniably queer-coded for very intentional purposes. I go into the history of homosexuality and male stereotypes all the way back to the Edo era in the 1600s to the Meiji Restoration of the 1800s, and I feel that I was very thorough in regards to understanding him, so please check out that video if that sounds up your alley. Now let's get back to the dungeon. The main issue and the reason there is a conflation between Naoto as the child and Naoto as the woman is due to the fact that both of these things are dismissed by Japanese male-dominated police force. While Naoto will one day stop being a child, she will never stop being a woman, unless she takes more extreme measures to hide it, and once again, the fact that she has to put effort into hiding her identity is also what is implied, that she will have to keep hiding her identity her whole life if she doesn't want people to know. Not only the woman or the child, but the detective character itself. That is why it is her denying herself, because she actively is acting as a character that she has seen in stories, rather than being true to her own feelings and emotions. The aspect of playing a character also allows her to pretend to be someone else, someone without weakness, a smart, useful, non-emotionally complicated detective hero. It allows her to put up walls to those close around her, something found in her mini-boss and dungeon design as we went through. It's like role-playing as an imaginary person you want to be to get what you want, but you always still feel alone and unloved even if people accept you the character, because you don't feel like that character is truly you deep down. Going back to why Shadow Naoto says, Why? Why are you leaving me here? Why am I always left alone? It's so lonely. I don't want to be alone. The body alteration process then would apply to her very genome. All her DNA, the parts of her that are emotional and childlike, the part of her that is short, and the part of her that was born female. There is actually a very strong reason why Naoto's visual room imagery refers to an experiment of your very genetics, though. And it's hardly a reference to gender reassignment surgery, as has sometimes been claimed. When re-entering through Naoto's dungeon and getting back to the boss room, going on to the surgical table, you can pick up Naoto's ultimate weapon. It's a gun, called Algernon, with the description, named for an experiment in finding happiness, and this actually gives the full context for connecting her loneliness, her logical analytical side, and the experimentation metaphors. You see, this gun is actually a reference to a famous award-winning and frequently banned book, Flowers for Algernon, originally written as a short story by Daniel Keyes. Some of you may have read it in school, depending on where you went and what classes you took. It's a book about an experiment done on a rat named Algernon that rapidly increased the intelligence of said rat to astronomically high levels. The book isn't about this rat, though. Instead, it's about a man named Charlie, who is mentally disabled, with an IQ of 68. He signs up for the controversial experiment to try and recreate the success of a rat in a human being by changing the way that Charlie's brain works. The experiment is a huge success. Charlie believes that once he is able to become intelligent, he can finally understand all the friends that he has in his life and no longer have to rely on others to explain and understand things to him. He believes that this will make him happy, that he'll be accepted by them. The first twist in the story is that Charlie's newfound intelligence allows him to realize that all the people he once thought were his friends were actually teasing and bullying him for being mentally disabled, and that now that he's able to recognize their teasing, they don't want anything to do with him anymore. Another struggle is that Charlie's emotional intelligence doesn't rise alongside his logical side, leaving him smart enough to understand his loneliness, but too emotionally stunted to properly establish relationships with others and escape it. Something that could easily be said about Naoto, being a prodigy in terms of intelligence, but unable to read social situations. The real kicker on this unbelievably sad story is that after a time, the rat Algernon begins to lose its intelligence, with the experiment wearing off. In one version of the tale, Charlie writes diary entries describing his feelings and thoughts. With the end of the book, you can see him gradually losing his intelligence as his words and sentences become simpler and less and less articulate. 
This is the connection that we're meant to make with regards to Naoto's emotional stiffness, her inability to understand jokes, her deep loneliness and desire to have a reason to stay and to be wanted and needed by the people around her. To be useful. She believes that if she were to change herself, she could obtain happiness, finally. But as the story of Algernon shows, only greater unhappiness would come after it because Charlie wanted intelligence for the happiness that he assumed would come from understanding the world, not because he was interested in books or learning languages. Naoto also seeks that happiness that she feels she lacks in her short childlike emotional and feminine form, and she believes that she will find it, but the experiment is destined to fail. So like Charlie had the rat Algernon, Naoto has a gun of the same name. Now on to how this reflects in her boss fight. The Naoto boss, as keeping with the theme of the mini boss, which reflected a self that she wanted to be, is half robot, with wings that can fly above the tallest places and a body larger than the largest man. Her emotionality seems to be gone, but shows some slight sadism in both the Japanese and English dub during the midpoint of health battle, hinting perhaps that the experiment was a failure. The premise for the shadow fighting also is that she perceives the others must also wish to ascend to their true selves, with the irony being that the cast already has, but not through some change of who they are, but a realization and natural self-affirmation directed at interchange. When Naoto awakens, her voice is slightly more feminine. She gives some insight as to who she is. I lost both my parents in an accident. I was still young. So my grandfather took me in. I was inept at making friends. So I spent my time reading detective novels in my grandfather's study. When I grow up, I'm gonna be an awesome hard-boiled detective. My parents were proud of their job. I had no qualms about following in their footsteps. An inherited occupation can feel stifling to many, but I welcomed it. I yearned for the day I could be a detective myself. I was always alone. Seeing that, my grandfather must have believed it was his duty to help me realize my dream. I secretly aided my grandfather with his clients, and before I knew it, people started calling me junior detective. At first I was delighted, but not everything went so smoothly. Not everyone welcomes my collaboration when it comes to solving cases. My status as a child was sufficient to offend many of those whom I worked with. Were that the only issue, then it would have resolved itself with time. But though I will one day change from a child to an adult, I will never change from a woman to a man. My sex doesn't fit my ideal image of a detective. Besides, the police department is a male-oriented society. If they had the slightest concrete reason to look down on me, no one would need me anymore. I'm sorry. I kept ignoring you, pretending you didn't exist. What I should yearn for, no. What I must strive for isn't to become a man. It's to accept myself for who I really am. As with the previous party members, I actually talk about the ultimate persona in a different segment, but I'm going to talk about Sukuna Hikana specifically here and how it connects to Naoto. Because Sukuna Hikana and Naoto's final persona, Yamato Sumaragi, are actually very separate in background. Naoto awakens to her persona, Sukuna Hikona. Sukuna Hikona, also sometimes referred to as Sukuna Hikona no Kami, or Sukuna Bikona, means small man of renown, which fits Naoto's self as perceived by Inaba as a well-known and renowned detective prince. Sukuna Hikona is a small god who supposedly rode into Izumo, meeting Okuninushi. Initially, Sukuna Hikona was skeptical of Okuninushi, and upon being picked up, bit Okuninushi on the cheek. After the initial quarrel, though, Okuninushi and Sukuna Hikona became very good friends. This mirrors the story of Persona 4, mythologically speaking, with the place of Izumo being connected to Okuninushi and the Hair of Inaba story. So, like Sukuna Hikuna rode into a new land, Naoto transferred into Inaba. Okuninushi is also a son of Susano, thereby also being a brother of Amaterasu, said to serve and protect Izumo alongside them. Amaterasu and Susano are Yukiko and Yosuke's ultimate personas, respectively, so this actually seems to be a bit of a reference to Naoto's initial pressure and skepticism toward the investigation team. 
being the bite on the cheek, before eventually realizing the good nature and true intent of everyone, becoming good friends, and by joining the party too. It is also said that he climbed onto the top of a millet stalk, that the rebound of slingshotted his little body into the land of eternity, the afterlife. This could also be a reference toward the next dungeon after Naoto, as that is the Heaven Dungeon. After the dungeon, Naoto is far more warm and welcoming with the crew. Well, somewhat embarrassed as it seems that the rumor of her being female has gotten out around school, she, while being warmer in tone, is still very dedicated to the case, and wishes to directly work alongside the investigation team from here on, as you would probably predict. In the meeting after, you also see Yosuke tease her over going down so easily even after preparing herself for the kidnapping. Naoto's response is a genuine, shy admittance to her perceived failure, as she admits that she was scared. This genuine, unguarded display of her feelings actually catches Yosuke so off guard that he immediately clicks out of his teasing mindset. This is the story's first move to give a more direct shot of Naoto's changed self following the confrontation of herself, even before the social link. Yosuke also follows this up with a crude compliment, which embarrasses and causes Naoto to blush and change the subject. This is her letting her walls down enough to be honest with the team and with her own feelings to herself. Letting those walls down also allows her to be more perceptive to the jokes that the team makes, rather than taking them personally or wondering if she's being attacked or insulted. It's a great improvement in just a few moments, sandwiched between the plot. She even offers to help Teddy to find himself and understand his past, opening herself up to be also relied upon. To start Naoto's social link, it's not as simple as talking to her. You see, Naoto is still very rough, awkward, and closed off, but she doesn't want to be seen that way. She doesn't want to feel like a burden or someone who is wasting someone else's time. So in order for you to hang out with her, the game tells you to find some kind of reason to hang out with her. The idea is, if there's something that's serious that needs to be accomplished, then she'll gladly spend all the time she needs with you and feel like she can be useful, which also allows her to be under no pressure to be pleasant and make small talk. This likely comes from her years of rejection, having trouble finding friends and spending time alone, her paranoia and closed off nature. This defense mechanism, while greatly improved, is still mostly operating in her comfort zone and how she's been acting from the start. This excuse we're looking for you'll find in a suited old man who tells you about a card that needs delivering to Naoto. When you tell Naoto about the incident and hand her the letter, it finally instigates the reason she needs to take action. A fun fact, Naoto is one of four social links who can be available on rainy days, alongside the Hermit and both of the Sun social links. Naoto immediately takes knowledge of this blank card seriously, maybe to a slightly comical degree. After both discussing the basic information, Naoto plans to take off. After some form of offering to escort her, she, initially confused, realizes you may be worried for her, and mentions how she's been made aware of her so-called tin ear to other people's feelings, and mentions how she has also been worried about you, and knows that you have responsibilities, so you don't have to worry about her. This shows that she is actively attempting to pay attention and understand the feelings behind the words that people tell her. Surprisingly though, she ends up asking if you would like to stay and chat a bit after all this splitting. Something that will become consistent with her link, and that shows her want to get to know you, even if she feels like she needs an excuse or an alternate reason in order to do so. Rank 2 continues with Naoto saying that she has deduced that she believes this to be a prank and doesn't want to waste any more of your time. If replying, really, or that's no fun, Naoto breaks out into laughter and the game says that she smiles like a child, a very intentional choice of words, I imagine. Naoto is opening up her true feelings to you and further showing the parts of herself that she feels embarrassed about, the immature side. She's allowing herself to be happy more openly, without being so guarded. Immediately after this though, things suddenly seem a little less prank-like as the Shirogane estate is supposedly broken into, with some of Naoto's personal belongings being stolen, although it seems to be nothing that she's personally concerned about. She insists it's nothing to worry about, and that you have more pressing matters to attend to at the moment. Seeing as this is the second time that you have continually expressed concern for Naoto, she shifts a bit and lets you know that she's not sure how to treat your concern for her. This is likely the neglect that she's been through in her youth rearing itself. 
with both her parents dead and her grandpa being so much older, despite them having a lot of things in common, mixed with her inability to make friends up until now. She likely has searched for this for a long time, but been too scared to receive it. Now that she has it, it probably feels like something subject for analysis, something that doesn't make sense, that she doesn't understand the cause of, even though to many it would be obvious. It's another sad aspect of her social stagnation, but a happy thing to see her receive, even if she is yet to understand what to do with it. When you start her rank 3 by offering to walk her home, she aggressively insists she's fine by herself, but after insisting to walk her home regardless, she softens and shows appreciation. She's still fighting not to let herself be seen as vulnerable or needy, to be a burden on others, but despite her aggression, it's obvious the cope is a very thin veil to her feelings. This link starts with a love letter. Naoto has no intention from the get-go of reading it, but doesn't want to possibly embarrass the sender by risking others find it, so she intends to keep it closed and feed it to a shredder. This is really interesting because it does a great job at conveying Naoto's concern and good intention with her rough ability to understand socially kind things. Her heart is there, her understanding is not. Saying that you intend to not even read a hand-delivered love letter and instead plan to feed it to your shredder might sound cruel out of context, but as Naoto's reasoning does it, it's actually done to risk another person finding the letter and making the person who sent the letter in a worse situation. It becomes a twisted act of kindness and care instead. Top that with her following statements on it, not mattering if the sender is a man or a woman, and that it is a trivial matter not even worth tending to, shows not just a fear of being rejected and an excuse to use importance to justify relationships, but now a willingness to use her serious focus as an act of escapism from the things in her life that she doesn't understand. Next, Naoto mentions the idea of them saying they love her without really knowing her, and how it's ridiculous to even try to humor that sort of thing. This is only a part of Naoto's struggle here, but it's a very similar one to much of Daisuke's struggle as well, with the acceptance of his true self rather than the person people expect him to be, and again feeding into that fear of rejection. Rank 4 is a mirror on the previous link, although this time instead of a love letter, it is a follow-up note on the unsolved card that you were asked to deliver. Now we reach the center part of Naoto's social link, which I'll try to avoid crazy summary of in each of these links. This set of links begins with the investigation to solve riddles and childlike magic tricks, like slightly burning the paper to reveal the letters written in lemon juice. This is essentially using a serious premise to force Naoto into behaving in childlike ways. Each time a riddle is solved, an item is discovered, the items that were stolen, in fact. Still, you decide to catch them together, which prompts a blush, something leading toward her personal conclusion when it comes to her uncertainty of your worry and care for her. When you tell her that you're glad she was able to get her first item back, despite her belittling the toy, a detective toy from her childhood, despite her trying to belittle the whole situation, your support shocks and befuddles her. I think it's because she was putting up an act, thinking that you wouldn't care of this dumb little investigation if it was for some childlike toy, as well as some personal embarrassment and guilt for dragging you into what was most likely a childlike situation. Your simple support of her in this situation makes her realize you care about her for her, and that she doesn't have to tailor her defensiveness around you. Instead, she displays a want to do the opposite, and begin tailoring her openness toward you instead, although she hasn't gained the confidence or certainty in her feelings at this point. You can see this first by the statement that says, Naoto is showing her unconcealed smile, a rare occurrence, and following with her fumbled blush riddled statement. I, uh, I, I think I'll let this play out, and, um, if possible, which you're intended to cut her off for and support her, because what she is trying to say but can't yet muster is the idea that you too are enjoying your time with her, because it's Naoto, not because of anything surrounding that. This is also a notable moment, as this is one of the only two moments in all of Persona 4 that you can reverse a social link, a mechanic that I honestly thought was removed when I first played the game, and I think many people mistakenly believe as well from Persona 3. Failing to support her here cuts off the link and requires days to repair it, and I think the sheer rarity for the reverse social link opportunities drives home the vulnerability that while she has come to terms with just being around you for you, and feels for the first time she has developed a relationship where she didn't need to negatively cater around their judgment for the sake of saving face, 
but she is vulnerable here, lacking the confidence to make that jump. Rejecting her here is a deep emotional blow. It's not just rejecting the continued solving of the case, but rejecting her idea that you care about her herself entirely. Rejecting her also causes her to blame herself, stating back to her being told that she's bad at understanding others, but instead of the usual, assuming others don't care and keeping her walls up, you did to her what she always fears. The one time she put her walls down. She assumed you cared, and she was shown wrong. But anyways, assuming you're not a heartless asshat who would answer like that, the social link goes on as normal, and you don't have to deal with that horrible scene. From here on, there's a search for another item, although this time, when discovering the item, Naoto gushes about her childhood and how she has always loved this item, although this gushing goes into an aspect that she herself has yet to bring up in the link thus far. That is, the societal gender roles and her interests. She mentions preferring robots over teddy bears, a callback to her mini-boss, and states how she liked high places and had secret bases in trees. This wording as a secret base also calls back to her dungeon. The Shadow Naoto was hidden away deep in her childhood secret base, surrounding herself with detective stuff and robots, and when you reached the real her, the investigation team confirmed to her that it was okay. That she did nothing wrong, and she's fine being interested in those things, in being a child or like a child, in not having classically feminine interests. For Naoto, though, it's always been about efficiency, the logically most practical path, and Naoto snaps out of her positive nostalgia to ask you again why she wasn't born male. How she feels so many parts of her life would be so much easier if she didn't have to face the discrimination of her not fitting into her gender role and she would have been more accepted by others. Instead, she feels out of place in her society by not conforming to the roles that she was told she's supposed to live by. On my first playthrough, I remember answering, your gender doesn't matter, because to me at least, that was my gut response. I thought the nothing you could do answer was quite heartless, and I'm glad you're a girl felt creepy to me. But the answer to instigate a flag for romance here is the girl option, and I want to explore why that is for Naoto. Just because you say gender doesn't matter doesn't change the problem that she's having. She knows her gender doesn't matter to her, or you, or any good person. She knows that she is allowed to be interested in what she likes, and that she likes what she does. The problem is, her gender and sex matter to other people, the people who have made her life hard. It's something that she can't help that will always be against her by someone. And this is true depending on your circumstances, regardless of your gender. By saying it doesn't matter, I see now it sort of fails to understand the root of Naoto's frustration, although she does respond positively. I'm glad you're a girl takes her momentary solemnness and the societal context for how she's perceived out of the picture. This response reinforces that you, the person who has been established by previous links to care about her, and not the circumstances for your hanging out, also cares about her for all the things that make her up. It's comforting to know that someone who spends time with her, that is not faced with the pressure that makes her feel out of place, sees those parts of her she feels so insecure about, and says, those parts of you. I love those parts too. The game says Naoto panics fiercely, which you can also see in her shocked blushing expression, unable to articulate a response. She regains her composure and states how hard it is for her to keep her composure around you, with one of the most personally romantic lines in the game for me following it. She ends the social link excitedly, asking what sort of person you were as a child, her second time inquiring about you on a personal level, this time much more personally from the last. From here, instead of being combative, whenever you speak with her before a link, she openly asks if you would like to spend some time with her. This link is mostly the same, and Naoto thinking back to her childhood and negative nostalgia, she remarks how she never once considered herself to be odd, or felt worried about being a man or a woman before she had even had peers who compared themselves to her as an outcast. How being a man or a woman was never a consideration to her, she was just her and she just liked what she liked. She talks about how she never used to worry if her hobby stood out, but how in exchange she had no friends and was utterly alone. It's a double-edged sword. She was so lonely, and yet she didn't feel like she had to tailor herself to everyone's expectation. But that now that she's grown, 
It has become a major part of her personality to do so, and exactly for the people who don't accept her otherwise. She mumbles under her breath the need to change and the desire to stay the same. They're all mixed together, and it scares me. The game follows that, stating that Naoto looks smaller than ever before. This idea that she needs to adjust to society to achieve the things that she wants, but that some of what she wants is to stay as who she is. A little girl who didn't care if she liked robots or detective novels, who didn't feel inferior or out of place when surrounded by men on the workforce. The desire to be accepted for herself, and the desire to be accepted by society. The desire to change herself, but the desire to stay true to who she's always been. This becomes the next conundrum of her arc. The game even slaps you in the face with the importance of her stating this around you, saying that she would show this side of her to you must be a sign that she's opened her heart. She ends just like last time, asking if you've ever felt the way she does, and asking you to tell a little more about yourself. Rank 8, it looks like we see the man that we've been looking for as they brandish a knife in front of Naoto. You jump in between them to protect her, and it turns out that it's fake. Another toy that Naoto made that was in the process of being hidden from her. Naoto responds to this protection very much like Chie does in her own Link under similar circumstances. Naoto berates you for what she thinks is carelessly throwing yourself into danger for her sake, something that since near the beginning has been established as an insecurity of hers. That she feels the negative, time-wasting, or risky things done on her behalf are a burden on the people that she cares about. She feels guilty for the time spent. She also says one of my favorite lines in her Link, I can't imagine becoming a woman just for a man to protect me. This idea of becoming a woman, presenting more femininely, has not been floated even once in her social link at all. It's something she is exposing about how she's been looking at the relationship between you two at this point, and the way that the societal gender roles would change if they perceived her as a woman. It leans into her possibly considering if she should drop how she's been acting for society's approval or stay with it for her own reasons now that she has the approval of somebody who truly cares about her, instead of rejecting her, that being you. So she gets angry at you for putting yourself in danger, showing her care for you, and berates you with a thought process she herself has been struggling to make a decision on. Naoto isn't weak. She's strong, she's intelligent, she's efficient and useful. She's afraid if she opens up to others, if she stops posturing in front of people that she never thought would accept her, that she will no longer have a role to fill. It's a comfort and an anxiety, the want to stay the same and the need to change. She follows up on how you're always like that, that regardless, you would always do that for somebody. Why? This is the official split for friendship and romance. As you can imagine, friendship mostly operates the same, but without some additional romance dialogue, and one specific moment that we'll get to. With her resolution being that she can be however she feels comfortable, that there are people out there who will love her for whoever she chooses to be, because Naoto is Naoto. Seeing as from a gameplay and also narrative perspective, Naoto Social Link features the biggest change from romance to friendship, I'm gonna be following that with the last two links though. Naoto's response and shyness to your confession causes Naoto to awkwardly make an excuse to dart off after needing a moment to sort herself out. She actually doesn't respond to your confession here, interestingly enough, instead choosing to assure you that you no longer need to concern yourself with the thief matter. The ninth social link, Naoto appears with the thief, revealing that it was apparently a play by her grandfather and assistant, Yakushiji, which is revealed to be the fake thief all for the aims of giving Naoto time to reflect on the things that she loved as a child, since her devotion to work has apparently taken priority even her own mental health and emotional struggles, as perceived by her grandfather. It's clear to the player that the idea worked, though, as Naoto did look back on her past, soften and consider herself a lot from the games that she was put through. My master has been terribly saddened by Naoto-sama's state of affairs lately. Lacking acquaintances to confide in, she devotes every fiber of her being to work. My master wanted Naoto-sama to regain the joy she felt in days past, to regain the feelings when all that she wanted was to be a detective, regardless of her heritage or gender. Next, despite this reveal, you and Naoto now engage in finding the final item under the joy of doing so for its own sake, rather than under this false pretense. 
It shows her change in openness and willingness to engage with things that are not absolutely mandatory or of the highest importance. It shows her ability to choose what's important to herself and also trust that the people who are choosing to be around her are doing so in good faith as well. This link also serves as a quiz to see if you've been paying attention to who Naoto is as a person, which she blushes and smiles at, giving the impression that while superficially doing the same thing in the same place, your relationship with Naoto and also Naoto as a person has grown a lot from the time spent and the self-reflection. She states how all this time she has done everything in her power to avoid being looked down upon, condescended to, to be taken seriously by others, and now she does this. Her grandpa had to remind her of the other things that were just, if not even more, important. She talks about how she believed if she had solved this case's murders, everyone would accept her for who she is, regardless of if she was a child or a woman. If I solved this town's murder case, then everyone would accept me. They would acknowledge me as the fifth in the Shiragane lineage of detectives. That's what I told myself. The best I could do was convince the police. And there was no way I could allow everything to come to light. Of course, I had braced myself for that during the case. But that's why I had to do the best I could until the very end. I just wanted to be accepted. I wanted to be needed. That's why I fretted and stood on my tiptoes and focused only on solving the case. But the original reason I wanted to become a detective, it was because mysteries intrigued me and I could help people by solving them. That's all. I remember now. Do you recall the time I faced myself in the TV world? It was my task to accept the self who yelled, I want a reason for me to stay. But my reason to stay was not solely to solve the crime. You, everyone, gave me a reason. You gave me a place to stay. I don't need to look for something to change or something to accomplish. I only need to have faith in myself. I finally think I can accept myself, that I'm a woman, that I haven't yet become the detective I wanted to be. I, I am a woman and a detective. One who will continue to pursue the truth with you and the others as long as I live. She follows with her response to the confession, with embarrassment, but with this it's easy to say Naoto has accepted herself and who she is. While the hot springs scenes are often criticized, I also want to mention how Naoto is treated in the two cutscenes. The first comes at the end of October, a time that it is impossible to finish or even get mostly through her social link, as the earliest day of starting it is the 21st and the cultural festival scenes start ramping up a handful of days after. In the scene, the other girls draw attention to Naoto's chest, which is stated to be the largest of the women in the game. I normally don't find that sort of thing relevant to mention, but this hyper-feminine biological aspect of her character, in tandem with her character arc, is also important for knowing Naoto. She doesn't want to be sexy or fond over. She wants people to look at her for her brain and the thoughts that she has. The idea of opening herself up to other people, even other women, is this new and embarrassing thing for her. Her stunted growth on telling jokes from praise or insult, her recent acceptance of her inner self, and now the girls who saved her life, it's such a hard step to take. But in being heaped with praise and adoration, well, like with most praise, she's uncomfortable in receiving it. From the other women to her, it's a way of telling Naoto from the investigation team that they accept her for who she is, and in fact are even impressed with those aspects that she finds insecurity in. This is reflected on well as if you get the true ending of the game, regardless to if you finish her link, the second bath scene with Marie shows Naoto to be mingling and actually have more assertive and open body language than many of the other girls, showing how much she has grown in the story, relying on and trusting the investigation team, but also as it's pretty hard to not finish her link if you basically get the full free month in January to finish the party out. It, while not required, can also be seen as an intentional parallel to the self that she fully embraces upon finishing her link. Rank 10, Naoto begins to overanalyze as a means of avoiding her flustered embarrassment over seeing your room for the first time. She gives you the matching compass that is mostly useless, but points to the other compass that she has if it's within a short distance. It's cute. After Naoto's usual embarrassment, she admits that the thing that she loved 
being a detective became a burden to her. That only through realizing that there is more to her worth than just the part that is a detective, she was able to love being a detective once more, able to stop using it as an escape from her personal problems, and instead as an embracement of it. From here, Naoto asks you unprompted how you think of her voice. In the Japanese, this mainly refers to the fact that she refers to herself as boku, which is typically done by middle school boys, while watashi is generally used by women and adults. If you say you like it higher, she says that she believes she will grow to like herself. If you state that you like it how it is, she thanks you for accepting her as she is. This is supposed to tie up the idea of posturing that has been a part of her link. She felt obligated to change so she would be accepted by others. She desires always to help others and to do things that make their lives easier and happier, but often she was doing it for people who would not accept her otherwise. After meeting the player, she finds someone who will accept her as who she is, and so she decides to go out on a limb, personally bring up what was within her own consent and boundaries, the idea she blurted out in her rank 8. Instead of changing who she is for people who don't accept her, she wants to tailor herself to the people who love her regardless of who she is. It's another means of accepting herself. While I always personally choose to keep her voice lower because I am based and I love androgyny, it would be an insulting mischaracterization and sore misunderstanding of Naoto as a character to state that the other option is somehow gross or wrong to select. Naoto prompted this herself within a mutual relationship of consent and privacy. Naoto asked this, not from insecurity, but from earnest, to prove how much she cares for you and how much you care for her. And in a way, that's sort of beautiful. This, in fact, fully awakens her to her new persona, Yamato Takeru. Yamato Takeru was a Japanese historical and mythological figure, a prince known for being extremely strong, roughly six feet tall, something impressive hundreds of years back, especially for Japanese standards. This tall person, in comparison to Sukuna Hikana, the small god, shows that while Naoto may still be short in real life, while she may still be a child, that her inner self has matured and grown into an adult, one who can stand tall of their own conviction. Yamato Takeru was also said to have been killed by a curse, turning him into a little bird that flew from the mountain. This is probably symbolized in the design of the great white wings. The sword is also likely a reference to the grass-cutting sword Yamato Takeru's myth has, but I don't think that there's much more to derive Naoto's character from, aside from the reference. This potential was still dormant within me. I wasn't considering the things that I should have. The people who care about me, as well as my own self. The detective. The child. The woman. The me who existed before them. I am simply myself. I'm glad to have met you. Then for her ultimate persona, Naoto starts talking about Inaba, but really is talking about a pattern of all of mankind, following in cycles that she often thinks of when solving serious cases. That man forgets the memories and wipes away the tears of hard times to stand up again, just to, due to their forgetting, make the same mistakes that land them back on the ground again. She states how this has bothered her, but how she feels like she's found her own answer to that issue. That through getting knocked down and standing up, you can always keep moving forward if you hold something precious onto you in your heart. That no matter how much is forgotten, you can retain a compass to find a better future. She always states how, for once, she feels like she can draw strength from those around her and is more powerful than ever before, evolving into Yamato Sumeragi. She states how, even still, she will keep learning and how she's sure she will keep changing too. That despite love and relationships of all kinds being frightening, they are something worth pursuing earnestly, with honesty to yourself. Naoto is the Fortune Arcana in Persona 4, also known as the Wheel of Fortune, formed by the Hebrew letter Kaf, which represents the grasping of the hand toward comprehension. The aims to understand the things around you. Naoto understood the technical, the practical, and the logical, but always had trouble understanding others and even herself on an emotional basis. When we first meet her, she is denying having to face this aspect of herself. She is in low polarity, but as her arc goes on, she grows, accepts, and understands herself by reaching out, letting her walls down, and trying to comprehend things fully. The four beings at each corner are the four beings that appeared in Ezekiel in the Bible, with the lion, the ox, the eagle, and the man, representing the four faces required of a leader all at once. 
The lion implies strength and confidence. The ox implies work, service, and dedication. The man or angel implies humanity and caring, while the eagle implies vision and awareness for both the immediate and the future. Naoto was at an imbalance of these traits, with the ox overpowering her and the man being non-existent. This throws her card into lower polarity, but by the end she learns to take work in its proper seriousness, and she learns to give credence and power to the humanity, empathy, and emotional understanding of the human angel. Rebalancing the Wheel of Fortune, the female sphinx on top of the wheel is she who stays stationary through the wheel's positive and negative cycles. She understands the cycle and the nature of how the wheel turns, being able to stay still and confident over life's riddles. This is likely a reference to the mentioned cycles of mistake that Naoto refers to in her link, falling down, rising up as a new man with new and forgotten memories, and how that riddle over the repeating cycle of humans seems to go on without pushing forward. Naoto becomes the Sphinx, the only thing definitively female on the card, when she accepts herself as a child and a woman, finding her answer that it is the bonds and the ones that we care for deeply who drive us forward through positive and negative fortunes of life. This card on the lower polarity represents a lack of understanding of the universe, that everything has a time and a place. We see Naoto engage with this over her rush to no longer be seen as a child, but while she cannot become an adult now, she is destined to in the future, in the right time and place. She learns the situation she finds herself in now, and is always an opportunity for any sort of change or growth that is possible and that reach toward the truth. Naoto's name, while being more classically masculine, is spelt with dozens of different kanji combinations. Naoto's name specifically is spelt with the kanji for honesty and the kanji for Big Dipper. Her last name Shirogane refers to Shiro, or of the white color, and Gane, sometimes read as Kane, also known as the word bell. You sort of get the image of the big holy bell ringing in the sky. Reminds me of Skypea. Her first name, other than the in-game stated reason that Naoto sounds masculine, which Naoto is insecure over, and Shirogane is the name of a very prestigious detective lineage that Naoto happens to be the fifth generation of, is representative of her loud, honest, and yet just nature. Something she first used to hide away, but as she got to know her true self, allowed herself to ring out. Naoto is a person obsessed with acceptance, the desire not to be left alone, unwanted, unneeded, and unloved, but in the process of logically plotting down how to solve this issue, loses herself along the way, leaving her unsatisfied in opposite ways to her past. The lie that she has to face in Persona 4's theme of truth is the lie that no one will ever love and accept her for her, and that she will always need to tailor herself around people who judge and castigate her. She learns that all of her, the emotionally inarticulate, the childish, the easily embarrassed, all of her has the capability of being loved and accepted by someone. By someone great, even. By many people. And that if you should care what anyone thinks of you, it should at least be someone who cares deeply about you already. Who cares about and accepts the deep aspects of yourself regardless to what they may be. That's Naoto Shirogane. Wow, this segment went way over my anticipated aims, but I have to say, and Naoto is my favorite character in Persona 4, I connect with her on almost every single level, this feels like an autobiography to do as an analysis. Every struggle, the emotional inarticulateness, the aggression to keep others away, the easily embarrassed side, the logical efficiency-focused work-driven side, the childlike side, it all connects to me so deeply, and I'm glad that I finally got to cover her in detail that I felt was worthy of her character. If you haven't already, likes and comments are amazingly appreciated as well as sharing this video because this is literally um, almost over 100 hours of work to make this video possible. This project as a whole, the P4G series, I mean, is huge and it's only one part of a greater spanning series covering all of Persona 4. So if you would like to support this project and see more in the future, please share this video anywhere it may be possible. Donate to my Patreon. Surprisingly, I don't make a bunch of money off all this. Uh, hope you're taking care of yourself and I'll see you soon.